Salisbury Plain, England, 2021. While traveling the UK, researcher Michael Goff visits one of the country's most famous landmarks. Like millions before him, he goes to see Stonehenge, the massive, mysterious circle of giant stones that draws as many as 9,000 visitors a day. Stonehenge is like a letter from the deep past. It's there, it's physical, you can't ignore it. But what does it mean? One of the things that people always talk about is just how difficult it would have been to move these large stones. We can start with the sarsen stones, the sandstones. The closest place they could be from is Marlborough Downs, which is over 20 miles away. Now to you and I, 20 miles might not sound that far, but these folks had no cars. We don't think they had wheeled carts either or any large beasts that could pull them. And these stones weigh an average of 25 tons. The largest stone of all weighs 45 tons. That's as much as an adult humpback whale. And that's just one stone. So how did they move them? Some believe the ancients used wooden sleds. Others postulated that they used wooden rollers made from tree trunks. Those are just the sarsen stones. The other stones, the blue stones, there's nothing like them anywhere remotely close to the site. The best estimate we have is that these stones come from whales in the Priscelli Mountains, which are 140 miles away. We're talking a vast distance for ancient technology. After the haul, the work is far from over. At the site, the stones have to be shaped with very simple bronze tools, chipping off small pieces to taper the stones as needed. Then to fit the upright stones with the lintels, the builders had to use an intricate tongue and groove system that was used predominantly in wood. And then using antler picks and stone tools, they had to dig out the cavity in which the stones could be placed so that they would stand tall and not fall. For centuries, scholars have debated why Stonehenge was built. But equally as puzzling is how it was built. In 1968, Swiss author Eric von Daniken believes he has simultaneously answered both of these questions. And the answer is aliens. Von Daniken claims it simply makes no sense that ancient people would have been able to transport these stones on their own and build these structures. And the fact that we still can't figure out how they did it is pretty suspicious. It forces us to ask the question, were people 5,000 years ago talented, smart enough, and had the right ability to build something like this? Von Daniken believes that aliens shared their technology with humans to move human civilization forward in the areas of science and technology. He feels they did this at several times in human history, and that explains many different monuments and structures all across the globe, including the ancient Egyptian pyramids and the Easter Island Moai structures. In 2013, an unexpected source offers proof of UFO activity in the area. In June of 2013, the British Ministry of Defense declassifies their final collection of UFO files after closing the program down. One of these files includes several photos sent to the ministry that show a disc-shaped object hovering over Stonehenge. This is just one of many reports of unexplained aerial phenomena at Stonehenge. In 2019, Philip Rosse is taking pictures of the sunset in Knapp Hill, 15 miles from Stonehenge, and he spots a bright spherical object on the horizon. The ball of light is then joined by another, and then several more. The spheres appear to create some sort of formation. They're hovering silently in the sky. In 2020, a couple driving in Mayor Wilshire observed a disk of light hovering near Stonehenge. Look at that thing in the sky. Whoa. What is it? They capture it on video, and just as suddenly as the disk of light appeared, it vanishes. But most modern scholars are skeptical. At the end of the day, is there anecdotal evidence of UFO activity near Stonehenge? Certainly. But is this evidence that aliens built Stonehenge? Not really. At this point, the more we study Stonehenge, in some ways, 
the less we know. But in 2021, Michael Goff believes he may have finally solved the puzzle. When researcher Michael Goff visits Stonehenge, he already knows about the monument's alignment with the heavens. And he thinks that was a purposeful choice. But while he's looking around, he realizes there's a lot more to it than that. Goth starts by studying how Stonehenge would have looked thousands of years ago before any of the stones were lost to time. He reconstructs the entire site and demonstrates that the monument's outer circle originally consisted of 30 sarsen pillars and the same number of connecting lintel stones. He also notes that the four cardinal points, north, south, east, and west, line up with the structure. This means sunlight is intentionally focused through the stones, casting light and shadows. This was all known before, along with the fact that Stonehenge tracks the length of a year since the annual solstice appears in the same spot every time. But Goff believes that with one extra tool, Stonehenge could track more than just the time of year. Goff figures out that if you add some smaller markers in the middle, Stonehenge could tell the time of day, every day, like a sundial. According to Goff, Stonehenge actually had moving parts that are now missing. These could have been little stones, or maybe even pieces of wood that have since been lost to time. Some small stones have actually been found within the monument that could have served this purpose. The real trick to this, however, is that these stones or markers would have had to been moved every year to keep the clock accurate. So how did they know where to move them? Goff believed they used a particular constellation, the Southern Cross, that would appear prominently right on the horizon in that area thousands of years ago. According to Goff, every year when the cross was centered in the Southern Gap at Stonehenge, the people could just move the small stones to calibrate their clock for the upcoming year. Around the same time, more evidence is uncovered to support this, but in a different location and by a different team. Archaeologist Michael Parker Pearson goes to Wales with a team to excavate in the area where the blue stones were found. There they find a dismantled stone circle made from blue stones at a place called Winemon. Researchers start to wonder if these Winemon stones might be related to the stones at Stonehenge. As they search for evidence using modern-day scientific techniques, they realize that these two circles have the same diameter of 360 feet across, and both are aligned to the midsummer solstice sunrise. But one small clue proves the connection is much bigger. There is evidence that Weinmann was dismantled. Most of its stones pulled up and removed, but in one of the holes, a stone chip is left behind. A computerized model is made of the chip, and incredibly, that chip fits perfectly into one of the stones at Stonehenge, one that's called Stone 62. It's like a key into a lock. Parker Pearson concluded that around 3000 BC, most of the stone circle at Wine Mound was dismantled, and the stones were carried the some 140 miles to Stonehenge. But why go to such lengths to excavate and arrange the huge bluestones only to then move them 140 miles away? Goff believes his clock theory holds the answer. Today, the Earth's tilt has changed so much that the Southern Cross is no longer visible at all from Stonehenge. This slow movement was happening back then, too. Goff believes that's precisely the reason Stonehenge was moved. Goff's theory is that the ancient clock was first installed at Waimon, because that's where the Southern Cross is at the horizon, and you can use it as a clock. As the Southern Cross disappeared from that location, they moved it 140 miles away, rebuilt it at Stonehenge, where the Southern Cross is visible at the horizon, and now you get another 100 years of use out of your clock. It's a pretty cool idea, but you also have to ask yourself, Scientists and archaeologists have been studying Stonehenge for centuries. How could a clock not have been discovered before? According to Goff, it's all because of the number 30. 
There are 30 pillars at Stonehenge, and therefore the clock theory never worked with our current 24-hour concept of time. That's why nobody ever figured it out. Once you try it with a day that's broken up into 30 parts, so a 30-hour day, Goff's theory works perfectly. The total length of the day is the same, it's just the hours are now 48 minutes long. Look, there's a popular saying in science, correlation does not equal causation. Just because your football team won when you wore mismatched socks doesn't mean this is why they won. And unfortunately, this applies to Goff's theory. Just because it lines up doesn't mean this is why they did it. You can apply this to pretty much every theory about Stonehenge. We'll never have any records that tell us what this thing is. These ancient builders have left us with a mystery that will probably never be solved. <laughs>